honestly, myofascial release has become one of my biggest passions. It is the most healing hands-on body work I have ever done. And I swear to God that the man is a magician. He does not use the term <laughs> magician, but I swear that man is a magician from the things he talks about. He talks about energy. He talks about energy bodies. He talks about spirit guides. He talks about past lives and going back and healing past lives and all sorts of wonderful things. So before we get started, I already said that, um, I want to tell you what you all are in for today, because this is going to be an interactive workshop. I am going to recommend that people do the exercises and do the, the techniques that I'm going to be teaching you, because this is very much self-care based. And I would love for you guys to learn, pick up a, you know, a few new techniques. If you don't know them, revisit some old techniques, if you already do know them. Um, so we're going to be doing a little bit of back to basics of magic and meditative practice. If you have been walking the pagan path, like many of you in this room have and are, then uh, you will get a refresher essentially of a couple basic things that we have all learned when we started on our crooked path. If you have never gotten a massage, I am going to teach you some things. If you have gotten a massage, I'm still going to teach you some things. <laughs> so basically we will go over um, a few different massage techniques that you can use on yourself and that you can use on other people as well. If you are quarantining with other people, you have you know your spouse or your partner or something and you Maybe you want to use some massage techniques because what, do, what else do we have to do in quarantine? <laughs> and then I will also be uh, going over the basis of MFR, myofascial release, because not a lot of people know what that is. And so we'll go over the basis of that, the fundamentals, how the fascial system works in the body, and I'll teach you some um, basics of self-MFR and how you can essentially turn any stretch into a myofascial stretch. And at the end of the workshop, I will be leading you through a guided practice that combines all three things, the magic, the uh, massage, and the myofascial release. And at the end of that practice, you have the opportunity to go into a myofascial unwinding, which I'll explain later in the seminar when we get to the MFR part. Um, for that part, if you can find a comfortable chair, um, a comfortable place to sit or lay down, that would be best. You can do this sitting, you can do this laying, whatever is most comfortable. I also recommend water. If anyone needs to go get water, I recommend doing that right now. Uh, the reason for this is because this is kind of a magic, but also kind of a body work workshop. And as a body worker, I always recommend to my clients make sure you have water on hand for after the massage. Whenever anyone comes to my home studio for work, I always give them a glass of water afterwards because massage and MFR, these are practices that don't just work the muscles, but they actually work your respiratory system, they work your circulatory system. They work all the different systems of the body together and it really gets things moving. It really kind of flushes things around. So if you don't have water, I'll give everyone a little bit of time right now to go get yourself a water bottle or to go get yourself a glass of water if you need it. So I'll give everyone like 20 seconds or so before we get started because I can see some people have, have left the room and left their chairs. <laughs> While we're waiting for that, I'll check the chat, see if anyone has questions. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Happy winter birthday. <laughs> um, if you have any questions during the seminar, feel free to use the raise your hand feature or type them in the chat. Uh, we should also have time afterwards for a little Q&A if anyone is, you know, has any questions and they want to save it for afterwards. Totally up to you guys. So let's see. All right, we've got at least one person still not back to their, no, two people, at least two people not back to their chair yet. So. We will give it a little bit of time so that they don't miss anything, and then we will get started. <coughs> don't worry, I don't have the Rona. <laughs> I don't think I do anyway. I've had, I think it's allergies. <laughs> All righty. Still waiting on a couple people to get back. 
and I, I am kind of that mom friend. So during the workshop, I will be, get, be like, guys, water break, make sure everyone drinks or stretches or something like that. Since, like I said, we are going to be doing a body working workshop today. Ah, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Brooke. So, um, anyone who's reading the chat, Brooke is a friend of mine and she is also a client of mine and, uh, she can attest to the myofascial experience. Uh, it's, it can be pretty, pretty intense for some people. It really, really just runs the gamut. I can't stretch with my headset on. Um, <laughs> we will figure that out, Lilith. <laughs> All righty. All right, we are still waiting on one person to get back with their water bottle. Oh, there he is, sweet. Okay, now that everyone is here, we will get started. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is self-care and why self-care is important. In a normal everyday life, when we are working, I know a lot of us are not working right now, myself included, but when we have to go to work, when we have errands to run, when we have kids to pick up from school and we have to take care of our kids or our parents and we have to make sure you know our children do their homework, we have to go grocery shopping, we have to make dinner, we have to make sure food's on the table. We are very busy people. And self-care is not a thing that a lot of people think about too much unless it's like, oh God, I'm super stressed out. I need a day or I need an afternoon or I need an hour in the evening to sit in the tub, bubble bath, bath bomb, or just turn the electronics off, read a book, go outside. You know, self-care looks different for everybody. And there are different ranges of it from just making sure that you've gotten up and you've gotten your stuff done to I'm going to go on a shopping spree because I really need to. So self-care when times are not crazy, like right now, still very important to work that into your regular regimen. Now, when we are in the midst of a pandemic and we're in the midst of what I am calling a modern day plague, it's even more important. And self-care looks even more strange and even more different because for some people, especially people who might suffer from anxiety, self-care can look like getting a list together of three things that you need to get done during the day. And that's it. And then you do those things and you're good. And that's a way to deal with your anxiety. For some people, self-care in time like this is getting a schedule put together and a routine so that there's still a sense of normalcy in their everyday life when we can't go outside, we can't socialize, we can't go to work, but we still need to to keep doing something. For some people, it's literally just getting up, taking a shower and going back to bed. So self-care is really important. And I want you guys to take a minute now and think about what self-care means to you. And when the last time you did something self-care. I'd like you all to think about that. And anyone who wants to share, feel free. Let me know, let everyone know what your self-care thing was. Hot shower last night, Rev Jason. Okay, there we go. Anyone else want to share what their self-care thing was? For me, I started watching the Avengers Cinematic Universe. <laughs> Eating healthier, same as Jason. Walk this afternoon, nice, nice. I am glad to hear that you guys are taking care of yourself because that is super, super important. Going outside while maintaining such, wow. Oh, <laughs> we got a lot of people in the chat. Netflix, anime, battle videos, long soak in the tub, doing my laundry and dishes. Lilith, I'm going to say you're definitely not a slacker for just doing the laundry and the dishes. Like I said, self-care right now because we are in a collective trauma. And when we're in the midst of a trauma, we can't process the trauma that we're in. We don't process that trauma until after the trauma has passed and we feel safe. So it's definitely, you're definitely not a slacker for being like, okay, I need to do the laundry and I need to do the dishes and that's all I get done today. If that's what you needed to do for you, then then by all means. Yeah, yeah, what's up, Willa? E even when I don't want to do them? <laughs> even when you don't want to do them, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, think about the self-care that you've done and then as this workshop progresses, think about maybe how you can incorporate the things I'm gonna teach you today if you want to, 
if there are things that speak to you, um, into a future self-care routine, into, you know, the next week or the next two weeks or the next month. So our current environment is very high stress. It is very high anxiety. There is a lot of this. We're on our phones and we're scrolling because it's, I am, <laughs> I am as guilty of this as everyone else. And it's like, this is one of the things that we do to kind of escape what's going on. But then we also have the constant inundation from social media of what is going on. So we're trying to find a way to relax, but then we're also being more stressed out. So yeah. Um, there's also possibility of low activity right now because we don't have the things that get us out of the house. We don't have the things that get us going to work, get us going. We can't even go to the gym for anyone who's a very physical. I'm a very physical person. I work out like five or six times a week. I do martial arts, like can't do a lot of that stuff right now. So like trying to find ways to still take care of ourselves and still do some of the things that we were able to do two months ago, that's a good form of self-care. Like setting up a home gym if you have the equipment for it or going outside for a walk, getting fresh air and exercising, getting the blood pumping, something like that, you know? So with all that being said, we are going to move into magic as self-care. So we have a lot of witches and pagans and Wiccans in this room. Can anyone tell me how magic is a self-care practice for you? Anybody? Meditation, yes, Patty. Meditation is definitely on that list. That is actually one of the things that I'm going to be talking about today too. Anybody else? Conectarse con la naturaleza. Sorry, say again. Conectarse, connection of the nature. nature. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Yes. All righty. I like the answers I'm seeing come in the chat. Meditation, breathing, stretching, morning affirmation, self-reiki treatments. Correct. These are all things that I was going to touch on today and how magic is a multi-planar self-care technique. So for simplicity's sake, for this workshop, when I refer to the different planes of existence, I'm going to be talking about four planes, physical, emotional, astral, mental, creative, and spiritual. Just, just to make things super simple, we, you know, we won't get like, up into divine and monadic and like all of those things. We're just, we're gonna keep it simple for this workshop. So magic definitely affects at least the top three planes. They're the first ones that come to mind. The top three planes, spiritual, mental, and emotional. When we meditate, we're diving deep into ourselves. There's a lot of shadow work that comes with being pagan and being Wiccan and being a witch. There's a lot of self growth. So that affects our emotional plane that affects our mental plane. We look at ourselves, we see the things that maybe we didn't want to see. We see the things that maybe we were hiding from and we decide whether or not we're going to face those. How can we learn from the shadow aspects of ourselves? When we do things like daily affirmations and speaking with our gods, we are building that spiritual connection. So we're working on our spiritual health right there. You know, we're, we're looking around, we're seeing our signs and our omens from the spirits and the gods that we work with. And that gives us a sense, this like the sense of love and the sense of connection with everything. So magic for sure in meditative practice, the first thing we can think about is how it affects the emotional, spiritual, mental planes. But what about the physical? Well, in the chat, we had already mentioned breathing, controlled breathing and visualization are actually the two back to basic practices that I was going to be getting to today. Because when we are doing our breathing techniques, especially if you know we're, we're sitting upright, we're making sure our posture is good, we're belly breathing, we're doing that diaphragmatic breathing, we're bringing it in through the belly, we're really working out our lungs and we're getting that oxygen into our system. We are calming the nervous system by doing this deep controlled breathing. 
we are calming the mind by doing this as well. We are getting ourselves into more of like an alpha state brainwave, uh, brainwave wise, when we go into meditation, into magical practice. So we are helping to bring our bodies out of the constant fight, flight, freeze mode that we're in because our nervous system is always firing because we are so stressed out as human beings. Being human is a very stressful experience. Can anyone else attest to that? <laughs> so we can, when we get into the breathing, it helps to calm us, it helps to center us. And then when we get into visualization, we're also working on our brain and we're also working on our brain power by doing that. We're working on focusing, we're sharpening our mind. So magic as a self-care practice for sure spans all four planes that we're talking about today. So I would like everyone to get comfortable because we are going to get back to the basics right now. For the people in this room that are pagan of some variety, this will be a very nice, um, not reminder, reminder is not the right word, um, but you know, it'll be, yeah, nice reminder, I guess. Refresher, thank you, Rev Jason. <laughs> I knew it started with an R. Uh, it'll be a nice refresher to get back to. And for the people that do not have a magic or meditative practice, or maybe have wanted to take up a meditative practice, this is a good technique for you guys to be learning as well. So I'd like everyone to get into a comfortable position. You can be sitting, you can be lying down if you want to. If you're gonna be lying down, I recommend lying flat on your back. That way your neck isn't crunched or your lungs, excuse me, your lungs aren't um, being crushed or, or shortened at, uh, at all. If you're sitting up, if you can, kind of sit up straight, you know, don't do the slouching because the slouching will make it harder to breathe in. So sit up straight. You can sit with your legs crossed. You can sit with your feet on the floor, whatever you want to do. Oh, no, I, don't at all. I know some people like to do the standing as well. <laughs> so. If everyone could please close your eyes and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to walk us through some deep belly breathing techniques. So what we're going to do here, we're going to close our eyes and you're going to inhale through your nose. You're going to inhale through the nose, fill up your lungs from your belly first, and then raising the air to the top of your chest. And then when you have a full breath, I'd like you to hold it for a couple of seconds. And then gently exhale through your mouth. We're gonna do that again. So we're gonna inhale through the nose, deep into the belly first, raising the air up into the top of the lungs and then hold. And exhale. Fully exhale your lungs. Now what you're gonna find is that you will have your own rhythm for breathing. So I'd like you to start with your own rhythm. You don't have to follow me exactly. I take very deep, long breaths and I hold for a long time too. <laughs> so you don't have to necessarily follow me. Find your rhythm and find what is comfortable for you. But the important part is inhaling through your nose, deep into the belly, before filling the rest of your lungs. Hold it gently, and then exhale very softly out your mouth, expelling all of the air from your lungs. <laughs> Why yes, Phoenix, I am check, uh, tricking everyone into checking for respiratory system symptoms. <laughs> so, this deep belly breathing is very good for what is currently going on because the COVID-19 virus affects the respiratory system. So this is a great way to check your respiratory system to see how you're doing. Well, uh, speaking on that, Phoenix, one thing that I, um, that I read recently is in the morning, if you can take a deep breath like this, the deep diaphragmatic breath and hold it for 10 seconds, comfortably for 10 seconds, then your, your respiratory system is okay. All right. Now that we've had that little uh, interjection by my blessing, 
Um, we're going to get back into that breathing. So everyone, please go back to close your eyes and get back into your breath because we are also going to do a little bit of visualization right now. Breathing and visualization, two of the most basic things that we learn when we start a magic or meditative practice and two things that help with the body, with the mind, with our emotions, with our mental clarity and help us to connect with our higher selves, help us connect with the universe, with Wonka Tonka with the great oneness, with goddess, with God, with whatever you happen to believe in or don't believe in. So if everyone could deep breath in and hold and exhale and hold. And we're gonna keep doing the inhale and the exhale. Now what I would like you to do now is to do a body scan. Basically, feel your consciousness in your body. Maybe see it as color filling your toes and then filling your feet. And then just filling, going up your legs. You can't see, I am, I am trying to show everyone going up the legs. <laughs> um, going up the legs, just fill yourself with color, essentially. A color to you that represents healing. It could be a nice calm blue. It could be a very nice kind of seafoam green, maybe something vitality, you know, orange or red. Or it could be something silver like moonlight, gold like sunlight, or white diamond holographic glitter. Whatever you see as a healing color, I love for you to see yourself from your toes, moving up your legs, moving up into your hips and your torso, your chest, your shoulders, going down your arms, all the way to the tips of your fingers, coming up your neck, your head, fill yourself with this light. Breathe in the light, and as you exhale, exhale a puff, a little cloud. What color is illness to you? Is it like gray and smoggy? Is it like black ash? As you inhale, inhale this light and see the light. And as you exhale, exhale this cloud. Inhale the light and exhale the cloud. All right, when you guys are ready, see the light fade from view. You're kind of back to being a normal you colored you. You can open your eyes, you can come back to uh, consciousness in the workshop. And I recommend everyone have some water. <laughs> water break, or as I like to tell my friends, hydrate hippies. <laughs> Alrighty. So magic for sure, multi planar self care, especially if we do the meditations, the affirmations, the morning kind of, you know, salutations to our gods, our prayers, those sort of things. Definitely multi-planar self-care. Now, how about massage? I do devotionals every morning. I love, I love that you guys are in the chat, by the way. I love seeing everything in the chat. It makes me so happy that you guys are also um, participating and doing the, the practices too. So, um, so yes, massage. When we think of massage, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is physical self-care because it's body work. But how is it also emotional or mental or spiritual? Can anyone think and maybe share with the class um, how they think that massage as a physical body work? Yes, Aisha. I can try. Um, so for me, massage, when I get a massage, it seems like it releases all the blockages and it just relaxes me all over my body. And it shows me things that I'm supposed to work on that I didn't know that I had to work on in my muscles. Perfect. Yes, that is definitely one of the ways that it helps on multi-planes. 
And in the chat, we have Rev. Lori Denman saying chakra balancing. My massage therapist always aligns my chakras as we go. Yes, that is definitely something that helps on multiple planes. Anyone else? So for me, um, getting ready to go to a massage, I always become aware of like a lot of my physical vulnerability and um, like physical self-image issues. Okay, so it takes you to a place of vulnerability and how do, how do you work through that? I let you massage me. <laughs> yeah, that's true, you do. <laughs> so, massage. Um, a lot of people have, oh, wait, we have someone else in the chat helping drawing out negative whenever you rub your wife's feet. Hey, I mean, the feet are very important. We can get into that later or we can talk about that in another time. But yes, feet are very, you know what? I'll say it really quick. Feet are very important. If your feet are screwed up, the rest of you is screwed up because that's your foundation. Quick and easy. So massage your feet, massage your partner's feet. They're not gross, I promise. <laughs> husband and I always rub our feet. Nice. Okay. So massage has had this connotation about it, about being a leisure expense, about being pampering, about like a spa day out that people don't usually take part of on a regular basis. That's kind of how it has been viewed. But I'm very happy and slightly biased as a massage therapist to say that the view of massage has been changing within the past decade or so, and it is being more and more viewed as a part of a regular self-care regimen. Because when we have issues, like if we sprain or strain a muscle or we're in a car accident, we go see a physical therapist or we go to an acupuncturist for various things. You know, we go to a chiropractor for realignment of our skeletal system and massage is finally starting to be seen in the same way because we are seeing professionals for the things that they know how to do that we don't same thing with massage we have to learn all of the muscles of the body what they do where they connect all of that sort of thing the nerves that innervates them the the systems how they interact with the different organ systems of the body so come see a massage therapist for physical self-care and it's great that people are seeing it as more and more of a self-care regimen. People go to a massage therapist for chronic problems. Um, they go because they have general soreness. And some people, like, uh, like Aisha, you mentioned, you feel like you get more of a release too. When there's a client on the massage table, I can't tell you how many times I've had people get on the table, and then tell me their life stories because they have a captive audience for an hour. <laughs> but by getting that out, by being able to verbally express the things that have been bothering them or the anxieties weighing on their mind, they are able to release some of that energy and that most certainly affects them on an emotional level and on a mental level. I have people that have gotten on the table and at the end of the session, some of them may have wanted to cry a little bit because we've had a really good conversation. We've worked out parts of their body where some of that energy might be pent up, let some of that out, and they feel like they have this huge release and it's so healing. Now, what about the spiritual plane? Can massage be spiritual? What does everybody think? I think it can be. The times that I've gotten massage for me is not only self-care, but I do meditate at the same time. And I Perfect. travel. Yes, 100 points for Aisha, for Lady Calypso. That is actually exactly what I was going to say. Sometimes, especially if you are of meditative or magical mind, while you're getting body work done, you can use that time while your physical temple is being taken care of to dive deep into yourself. The physical ails and soreness are being worked on. You don't have to worry about it. You're lying on a table that's hopefully heated because heated tables are the best, let's be honest. And you can really just go inwards and maybe see, like she mentioned, what comes up as you are being worked on by the body worker. 
So it can be very, very uplifting emotionally to be, to get a massage. Obviously, physically massage has great benefits. Mentally, people can come off the table feeling like they are more sharp, more mentally clear that the fog, if they've been having some sort of fog, the fog might have been blown away or lifted at least for a little while. And spiritually, you know, if you go deep into a meditation, you could maybe get some shadow work done while you're on a table or, you know, depending on if you work with a particular God or goddess or spirit, you could dedicate that self-care time to them. If they're uh, like Kuan Yin, let's say, healer and compassion. A lot of us as pagans and witches, we are healers as well, but we also need to heal the healer. We need to heal ourselves. So for someone who might work with Kuan Yin, you could dedicate you getting a massage to someone like that. Uh, let's see, Rev Robel says, I dedicate my self-care time to Eros. That's fantastic. Yep. Oh, I love that everyone's in the chat. This is self-care as well. They're able to speak their attention on a verbal way while you're working on the physical. Yes, fantastic, guys. Thank you so much for sharing and thank you for interacting. So now we're going to get on to some massage techniques. So do you have skin available? Do you have arm available or leg? I am wearing shorts, but like, do you have leg available? <laughs> Cool. And you can also do this through pants or through long sleeves if you are wearing something like that as well. So I want to teach you all some basic massage moves that you can use on yourself when you're stressed out. If you have soreness, you can use them on a partner. You can use them on a friend. So the first technique that we are going to go over is the basic introductory of touch technique. It's called effleurage. A lot of these techniques have a French name. Well, at least two of them. Yeah. <laughs> so effleurage, if you have, we're going to use my arm as an example. Let's see. Let me, here we go. Okay. So we're going to use my arm as an example. Effleurage is a long gliding stroke. You are going usually with the length of the muscle and it usually starts off gently because you are introducing touch and if you're using an emollient of any kind, emollient being a gel, a cream, an oil, a lotion, because it's a lot easier to massage if you are using some sort of lubricant because it gives you glide and you don't get stuck. Um, for people who might not have, you know, like massage lotion or something at home, you can use your favorite hand lotion. Um, you can use coconut oil. Coconut oil, don't use too much of it because it'll get really oily really fast. So it's better to start off with a little bit and then add more. Otherwise you're gonna look like you're about to go jump and do a frying pan. <laughs> so the effleurage stroke is a long stroke. You are going to be introducing touch. So start off gently. This also introduces any sort of lubricant that you might be using. You can then, when it gets more comfortable, start to deepen your pressure. One of the things that this does also, it helps to warm up the tissue so that your tissue um, is ready for the body work that's about to be done. So on an arm, it can look like this. You can, on hands, you can do kind of like a pulling. Mira que trae el micrófono aquí se... Sorry, what? No, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, and then you can do this basically on any limb. You can do this on a torso. Um, for the shorts view, you can do this on a leg. You can do down the thigh, you can do down the leg, down the calf. So basically the effleurage stroke is introducing the touch going along the length of the muscle. So this is really good for those long muscles. If you're doing this on a partner, on a friend, the back, those long strokes down the back, um, you can get the whole, get the whole hand in there. So that's effleurage. The next one is called petrissage. And this is your lifting and squeezing technique. So using my arm as an example, 
it's kind of lift and squeeze. Maybe this side would be better. So it's basically squeezing. If you have ever given anyone a shoulder massage, or if you have ever gotten a shoulder massage from anybody, the trapezius muscle right here, these guys that really suck, that lifting patrissage. So yes, Patty, I can see you doing it. That is exactly, that is exactly um, what it is perfect for is those upper traps. So you can do it cross hand on yourself. Just try not to choke yourself or you can do it. This is a little bit harder. It's easier to do cross hand up here. So about these muscles, the reason they suck is because especially for someone like Phoenix and myself and a few other friends of mine that I know have joined in here. If you live in Buffalo, New York or anywhere around here and it's winter, we do a lot of this. There's anyone who does not like the cold, we do a lot of this. And when we lift the shoulders, the muscles right here are the ones that are activated. So petrissage is great for the upper traps. Oh yeah, stress in the shoulders. Yup, that's usually the, the stress point for everybody. Petrissage is great for meaty areas. Petrissage, you can, e you can even do it on your forearms. There's usually not as much muscle to get in the forearm, but it does feel pretty great. Again, legs, the lifting and the squeezing. It's really nice on calves too. <clears throat> You will see today that I do not wear matching socks, just so everyone's aware. Life is too short. <laughs> All right, the next one I'm going to teach you is a, uh, like it's a circular move. It's kind of like a circular effleurage because the pressure is a little bit deeper than friction. Friction is a very superficial, uh, very light, bringing blood to the surface, warming sort of move. And with friction, you can go really quickly, not a lot of pressure. You can go in circles, you can go back and forth. But the one that we are all used to is the circular kind of more effleurage, which is a deeper pressure on our temples. When we get super stressed out, when we like face palm really hard that we just go straight into the temples. <laughs> when we have migraines, there's a lot of pressing into here. So this is great for relieving those migraines, relieving those headaches, going into the temples. You can do this in the upper traps as well. See if I can get better view. I'm all red now, but like doing like deep circular motions into the upper traps in the levator scapula. If you have a sore spot, a sore muscle like in your arm, you can really just dig and dig in there. You can get into the scalp, and if you use your fingers like rakes, you can just go circular. So these are all things that just feel fantastic, and they can help. They can help de-stress. And the last one that I want to teach you all today is to potment, which is not a move to do on somebody's back right above their kidneys. That is the, the only contraindication for this one is don't do it on the kidneys. This one is the move that we all think of when we think of like massage in movies where someone is getting like, ah, like they're getting beat. So tapotement is like a drumming technique. You can use an open hand. You can use the ulnar side of your hand. You can use the ulnar side of your hand while it's cupped. You can use your hand while it is cupped. There's a lot of different ways to do depotment. And yes, Rev Alyssa, thank you so much for also pointing that out. Do not do depotment directly on someone's spine either. <laughs> we do not want to break their bones. <laughs> so only, really only on non-delicate uh, organs and uh, on meaty muscle parts. And this one, you can definitely do it on those upper traps as well. It's gonna suck. I'll tell you right now, it will suck if you do it. It's gonna be very sore. <laughs> But yes, so to recap the four techniques, effleurage, the long stroke, petrissage, the lift and squeeze, as I like to call it, the circular effleurage, really great for scalp massages, really great for those upper traps, 
really great if you've got a, a knot in your thigh or something, those big meaty muscles, and then to potent. It's a lot easier if you do it with two hands. We'll go back to the shorts. A lot easier if you do it with two hands as opposed to just one. So that's what it looks like when you're, oh yes, and you can also do it as a fist. For anyone who might be dealing with congestion in their lungs as well, um, if you are working on someone who has lung congestion, oh, hey, Alyssa, <laughs> you typed it as I was saying it. <laughs> um, you can have a person lie on their side and with the cupped hand, you definitely want the cupped hand, you can go along their back, up and down their lungs, and that can help loosen the congestion in the lungs as well. So, now that we've covered the massage portion, water rake. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna get into one of my favorite things in the world. And um, I promise I will not go on about it forever because then we'll be here all night. And I don't think everyone wants to be here all night. Aisha, I know that you have a workshop coming up soon. So <laughs> myofascial release. Aside from Alyssa <laughs> and Brooke, does anyone have any idea of my what myofascial release is? Have you ever heard of it? Um, I'm getting a lot of shaking of heads. Oh, Patty, you've heard of it. Okay, all right, we have at least one person who's heard of it. Lilith, you're my physical therapist, told me about it. <laughs> Phoenix, of course, you've heard of it from me. <laughs> all right, so, myofascial release. I'm gonna try and make this brief. I will um, not go into as much detail as I can because like I said, I could be talking about it for the rest of the night. So you have massage therapists who are traditionally trained to work on the muscles. You have chiropractors who are traditionally trained to work on the structure of the body, on the skeleton. You have people who work specifically on the nervous system. You have people who work specifically on the cardiovascular system because our modern medical system is very reductive. They have taken the human body and they have said, we will take the lungs and the respiration and we will study this and only this. And we will take the heart and the circulation and we will study this and only this. And we will take the brain and the spinal cord and the nerves and we will study this and only this. So they have taken the human body and they have chopped it up into different systems. And the way that we are taught doesn't really tie all of these systems together in a very cohesive way because it's very... Well, you know, if you have this problem, you need to go see a neurologist and they're going to give you this medication because of a nerve problem. Well, what if it's not a nerve problem? Um, does this also tie into yoga? Thomas, yes, it possibly could. We will get to that. Um, so like, what if the nerve problem that you're experiencing isn't actually a nerve problem? What if, you know, problem A, B, and C has these symptoms, but everything that you're doing isn't working because maybe it's not a, B, and C. Rev Jason, holistic healthcare, correct. So the fascial system, um, <laughs> modern science is finally catching up with people who have been studying this for about 50 years. Um, the man that I mentioned before, John F. Barnes, who I have had the honor of learning directly from, as well as uh, doctors like Jean-Claude Gambarteau, this is an amazing book. I will tell you about it later if you are interested. Uh, they have been studying the fascial system independently for around 50 years. It wasn't until about March or April of 2018 that our modern medical system said they found a new organ uh, and that it connects everything in the body and they call it the interstitium. This is the fascial system. The fascial system is actually what makes up the body. And the best way to describe it is to use a cotton ball for these purposes. So the fascial system, um, when anyone thinks of fascia, they think of a connective sheath that surrounds the muscle or the organ and holds things in place. Before I started learning about the fascial system and before MFR, that's what I thought fascia was. 
if anyone has heard of, has even heard of it, because a lot of people haven't, a lot of people think that it's just this connective tissue that wraps muscle. Think about if you have a chicken breast before you cook it. And sometimes you can kind of like just peel this, this sheet of tissue off of it. That's what people think the fascia is because that is partially correct. That is part of the fascial system. But what the fascial system is, is a fibrous system that connects the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, to our left elbow, to our right earlobe, to our right butt cheek, to our left fifth rib. But just those things, just those very specific things. <laughs> no, what the fascial system does is it connects everything in the body to everything else. It is truly what makes up the body. It is a fiber system. So if I take this cotton ball and I start to pull it apart, what you see still has shape and it still has form, but you can see that it's made of all of these tiny little fibers. That's essentially the fascial system of the body. And what's amazing about this system is that it goes down to the cellular level. Our cells have their own fascial system. And from um, the, oh, cool, Alyssa, great explanatory video for those interested is The Fuzz by uh, Gil Headley on YouTube. Very cool, thank you for adding that. So the fascial system, um, if you were to take out your organs and your bones and your veins and your arteries and your nerves and your brain and everything and leave just the fascia, there would be a perfect 3D model of you still standing there because the fascial system connects everything, keeps everything going, keeps everything moving. Uh, muscles, bone, organs, they're actually all uh, fascial tissue that are specialized in what they do. The bones are denser. The organs are more of that smooth uh, tissue so that you can have things moving around like food. So you have the fascia, which are these fibers that connect everything together. And then within that fascia, because it needs to move, you have what's called the ground substance. And that is the body's natural lubrication. And this is where trauma comes into play because everything, as we know, is energy and information, including trauma. And what happens with uh, the fascial system when we experience a trauma, and it could be something big like a car crash, or it could be something small that just continuously builds over time. That energy from the trauma that we experience, because usually we don't have time to sit and process and feel and heal, that energy will get stuck in our cellular system, in our fascial system. And when that energy gets stuck, our natural lubricant, the ground substance, solidifies. It goes from naturally gel-like more to like cement. And what happens um, is that this solidification can cause up to 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch when you have restrictions in the fascial system like this, which is we get range of motion problems. We get pain, we get neck pain, back pain, fibromyalgia, MS, like so many different things can be helped with MFR. So the ground substance solidifies, but we need to regel it. And that's where MFR comes into play. And that's why I wanna teach you all how to do some MFR because it is so powerful and it is so important. The fundamentals of MFR are time, um, they are, I had it written down somewhere. So the, uh, it's a static hold. There's a time component where you want to be holding anything for five minutes. The reason for this is because a sustained hold of gentle pressure helps the nervous system to calm from fight, flight, freeze, to realize that it is safe. It allows the body to realize that it is in a safe spot. So the trauma that it is still holding onto, it can finally release it 
it can finally be realized, worked through, and let go. So five minutes is about is a good time. The hold has to be for at least two minutes. And usually I'll hold for between five and eight. Because what happens is you will find that you have a barrier. So one of the things we'll do is I'll, I'll teach you essentially how you can turn any stretch into a myofascial stretch, like I said. You will find where the barrier is. As an example, let's say a neck stretch. You'll find the barrier where you don't want to go anymore. You don't want to get to pain because pain is not the goal here. You want to go to, okay, like this is comfortable. And then you want to hold it. And as you're holding it at the barrier where the tissue no longer wants to move, you essentially have knocked on the door and you are very waiting very patiently for the body to let you in and for the body to open the door and say, okay, we can release some of this. And then you will feel that release and it can be very gentle or it can be very like wild. It runs the gamut. It really does. And then after you work through that barrier, you find the next barrier and then you hold at that barrier. And then eventually that one will release and then you find the next barrier. So that's why there has to be a hold of at least two minutes for the tissue to even soften five minutes at the least really to get one of these stretches or these uh, techniques to work. So <laughs> we have the time component of five minutes. We have the, uh, the other component is uh, telescoping or what is also called active elongation. So for instance, if I'm working on my shoulder and I can't go farther than here because this is where it hurts. We're not just gonna hold here. We are going to actively telescope our arm outwards as if there's a string connected to our fingers that is pulling us outwards. And that's how we're gonna hold it. Active elongation, telescoping. We're not gonna go into pain, not gonna go into pain, but like, if this is where it starts to hurt, bring it back and then actively move it outwards. Because how the fascial system is connected is doing that, pulling outwards, even if your pain is here and you're going outwards instead of up, you are still working on all of the fascia, not only in here, but you're pulling it from your chest, you're pulling it down your side, you're working on it from your back and up into your neck with how it is all connected. And the third fundamental is presence. That's the reason I wanted to put this seminar together. And that's the reason we started with magic, with breathing, with visualiz visualization, because those things help us to get present in our body. And that's really important for MFR. If we're getting a massage and we're on a table and we're just there to relax, we can let our minds wander. But for MFR, it's really important to really be in our body and listen to the wisdom of the body. It might feel funny. It might feel weird. But the body knows what it needs to do and where it needs to go in space to heal and let go of the trauma that it's holding on to. As I like to say, and I know Phoenix has said this, and I know a lot of healthcare workers and mental health counselors say this, the only way out is through. And as John Barnes likes to say, the key to healing is feeling. With myofascial release, it can bring up emotions that we have not dealt with. It can bring up um, thoughts that we haven't thought of, you know, things we haven't thought of in a long time that, that really cause us mental distress that we put into a box and we chucked into the back and we just didn't want to think about it. Oh, okay. Um, hold on. Let's see. Thomas, the three basics again. Yes, of course. So the three basics are time. You want to hold um, a myofascial stretch for at least five minutes, at least five minutes. The second one is active elongation, also known as telescoping. So that is where, for example, if I'm having shoulder issues and I can't go past here because if there's pain, then you want to actively elongate your arm as, a, as an example. So as if there is a string that is tied to your finger and pulling you upwards and diagonal. And the third one is presence. Presence being really being present into your body, listening to, um, listening to the wisdom of your body. 
So to truly heal from the trauma that we are holding on to, we have to feel it. It kind of sucks sometimes, to be completely honest, to feel the things that we don't want to feel and to deal with the things that we haven't wanted to deal with. But the thing is, if we don't deal with them, they're continuously in the storage unit in the back of the brain. And we wind up living with a subconscious filter that we don't know we have and interacting with the world through that filter until we can actually bring up these things and deal with them and let them go. So before we get to the techniques, I do want to tell you about the unwinding. A myofascial unwinding is different for everybody. And you will have the opportunity to go into an unwinding if you feel comfortable during the guided practice that we're going to get into shortly. The unwinding is basically taking the reins off, letting your body, the consciousness of your body, not like the consciousness of the mind, but the wisdom of the body take over. And during an unwinding, a lot of times you might feel like the body wants to move in particular places, you know, like it wants to do this thing and it wants to stretch and it just wants to be all over the place. Let it happen because that's what the body needs to do to let go of whatever it's holding on to. They can be small unwindings too. They can be kind of like, kind of like little electric shocks. Not that you're going to feel like you're being electrocuted, but it can be like little jolts, little shockies. Um, they can be very big. They can be very smooth. They can be very jerky. It really depends on what you're holding on to and what you need to let go of. There's also the possibility that during the middle of this, you're going to hold and you're going to stop. This is what's called a still point. This is when essentially we are going out into our energy field and we are pulling trauma that we shucked out of the body and we have, you know, it's floating around in our aura somewhere and we are pulling that back into us to deal with it, to process it. So like I said, it might bring up emotions. It might bring up thoughts that you haven't had in a while. Um, you might feel like you want to cry. You might feel like you want to just scream. You might feel like you want to take a pillow and just beat it. If that's what you want to do and if you are comfortable doing that, let it out. It's so cathartic to let it out and you'll feel so much better afterwards. But that's if you want to. And it's if it comes up. It varies from person to person. And one more thing on MFR with many different sorts of body works, uh, body working as well as energy working, we are familiar with what is called the healing crisis. The healing crisis is when we get work done and the body has this new paradigm that it's working on and things kind of backslide a little bit. It's kind of like having to go through hell to get to heaven. Things get a little bit worse before they get better. So with any sort of body work, with any sort of energy work, with any sort of hell like healing work at all, there is a possibility of a healing crisis. So just to let you know, if you do wind up having a profound experience during our guided practice, and if things seem like they're getting a little bit worse over the next day or two, it will not last any longer than that. Nothing that um, I'm teaching you today is going to hurt you. Just listen to the wisdom of your body. And if you want, um, when we're done, I will throw my contact information in the chat, my email address, my Facebook page. You can feel free to reach out, message me if you have any questions or anything like that, especially if you're going through a healing crisis after this. So the best way to show you guys how to do a myofascial stretch, how about we start with the arm? Can everybody do this? Is this possible for everyone? So we're gonna uh, take those three principles, time, elongation, and presence. We're not gonna actually hold it for five minutes right now, <laughs> um, but we will, just to give you an idea, you go to the point in the stretch where you don't have pain, but it's like the end point of the stretch. And you're gonna hold it there. You can actively elongate, and you're just going to basically kind of pull your consciousness into your body and see what it's doing. This is how you turn any stretch into myofascial stretch, really. Holding it for about five minutes, 
you guys can let it go now if you want to. <laughs> Um, but what you want to do is, like I said, you want to hold it for that five minutes minimum. You might feel like a barrier has, um, has kind of released and then you can go a little bit farther and then you can hold it there for a little bit longer. Um, you can do with, uh, let's a back stretch. You can do this. Um, I don't have a chair, Lilith, but you can definitely do this in a chair by just kind of like leaning forward and kind of hugging your knees and rounding your back. But a good back stretch. Can you all see me? Hold on. Sweet, I think you can all see me. So a good back stretch is essentially getting into child's pose, going down and essentially holding child's pose. That could be a good back stretch. Um, a next stretch that you could do is dropping your ear to your shoulder. You can do that to both sides. You can also go forward. Don't go back because if you go back, you're gonna like really crunch on your cervical spine and that's just not comfortable. So you can go forward. Always keep the neck elongated, never crunch. Remember the principle of elongation. So you can go side to side or you can go forward. You can put the, the hands on the head, not pulling, but just let gravity and natural weight take care of that. So five minutes elongation, presence. And then if anyone suffers from TMJD, I wanted to include this one because a lot of us are stressed out and we clench our jaws and it's not really comfortable. You take your thumbs under your ears, your fingers go above, and essentially you can rest the heel of your palm right above your jaw. And you kind of squish your face in a little bit. We're all going to look a little funny right now. Kind of squish your face in and then you just let gravity hold and pull down slightly. So if you have any jaw problems, if you suffer from TMJD, if you clench your teeth, this is really good because it works on the masseters, it works on everything around here. So just to recap, time, at least five minutes, elongation and presence. That's what you need to turn any sort of stretch into a myofascial stretch. And like I said, don't go into pain. You wanna come back a little bit from pain just to where that end point is before it starts to hurt. All right, now we're gonna get into the guided practice. If you want some water, now's a good time. <clears throat> All right, so for this, because healing looks different for everybody, and because you have the opportunity to go into a myofascial, fascial, myofascial <laughs> unwinding in case your body feels like it's going to, I don't want anyone to get self-conscious. So right now, if you want to stop your own video feed, like turn your camera off, because some people might wind up going into full unwindings and everything. And I don't know if people are going to feel self-conscious about it, if other people are, are you know, going to be seeing them do that. So we are going to combine the techniques from the magic portion, the massage portion, and the myofascial release portion. So if everyone would please close your eyes and get comfortable. First off, I should say get comfortable before you close your eyes. <laughs> All right, so get comfortable, whether you're sitting, whether you're lying down, whatever it happens to be. And we're gonna get into kind of a semi-meditative state. So start with your own belly breathing, inhaling through your nose and filling from your diaphragm up, fill your belly before you fill the rest of your lungs. Hold it and then exhale gently out of your mouth. Find your own rhythm, find your own beat, find your own pattern. Bring your consciousness into your heart center and focus on your breathing. Your 
belly expanding, your lungs and chest expanding. And then exhaling. From here, I would like you all to see this beautiful arboreal gate in front of you, like a garden arbor. And there in front of you is a stone path, individual stones that have been set among the grass. On the other side of the path is another arbor. You're gonna walk this path. And as you walk, we're gonna count down from 10 to one. And we're gonna go from a very conscious state into more of a meditative state. So you enter under the arbor and you step on the first stone, 10. Nine, as you step on the second, you continue walking, eight, seven, six, five. As you continue along, you move more into this meditative state, four, three, two, one. And now you have passed through the arbor. Now that you are standing on the other side, you are conscious of your body in a way that you are within your entire form. I want you to scan yourself starting wherever is, you know, wherever you want to start. If you want to start at your fingers, if you want to start at your toes, if you want to start at your belly button, if you want to start at the top of your head. Take inventory of your body and how you are feeling. Take inventory of, is there any tension? Is there any soreness? Is there any pain? Is it an area that I can reach? What does it feel like? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it vibrating like, like a nerve thing, like nerve pain? Is it fuzzy? What does it feel like? How does it appear to you? What does it look like? Does it have any sort of visualization with it? Does it appear as like angry scribbles? Does it appear as a sunburst? Is there anything at all or is it just a feeling? Now I'd like you to pick one of the spots and using those massage techniques, if it is a spot that you can get to like the upper traps, go ahead and start giving yourself a little bit of a massage. Is it a long area, like your thigh, where you might be able to do some effleurage? Is it through something like a shirt or pants, in which case petrissage, the lift and squeeze would be easier to do because you're doing it through clothing? Is it an area where you can do that deep circular effleurage, again, like the upper traps, because the upper traps suck so bad? <laughs> Is it something like the jaw where you could do some circular motions or you can even pull along the jaw? Find an area and work on it a little bit. And really feel into it as you're working on it. How is your pressure? Listen to your body. Do you need deeper pressure? Do you need lighter pressure? Always listen to your body. Are you a no pain, no gain person? In which case you probably are gonna go a little bit deeper than someone who isn't. How does it feel? Are you feeling something in another spot now because you worked on the first spot? Is it starting to hurt in which case you can, you know, lessen up a little bit.
All right, now that we have worked on a spot, I would like you to pull your awareness again to your heart center, right around that heart chakra. We're not focusing on a single area right now again. We are pulling our awareness inwards and then we are spreading it outwards. Is there another area where you might be able to do a myofascial stretch? Is there an area that could use some stretching, some elongation, some loosening up? If there is, go ahead and do a little bit of myofascial stretching right now. Is it your fingers? Are you, know, are you an artist and your fingers and your hands have been cramping up? So you need to stretch your hands, stretch your fingers. Do you feel tightness in your chest? So you need to pull your arms back maybe to loosen the chest up. Is it tightness in the shoulders? Do you need to pull your hands above your head, pull your arm across your body? Do you have an area that needs a myofascial stretch right now? All right. So like I said, the time component for a myofascial stretch is usually about five minutes. But as we are starting to wind up here, I'm just gonna remind you about the time component so that you can do that on your own when we're done. Now I want you to listen to the wisdom of your body. And this is why if you still have your video going and you wanna shut it off now, you can. If you wind up going into an unwinding and you don't want other people to see, I will show you um, what it is possible for an unwinding to look like. And you can do it from your chair. If you're sitting in a chair, you can lie on a bed, lie on the floor, lie on the couch. But what you wanna do is first stretch. Stretch as much as you can. You're going to stretch out and you're going to really elongate and feel where you might need to let go. So if you're sitting, you can stretch from your chair or if you're lying down, and I'll show you that real quick, you can stretch out as much as possible and starfish yourself. Feel like you are, you have strings that are tied around your limbs and a string at the top of your head pulling you in all different directions and really focus on your body and how your body feels. And as you're focusing on the wisdom of your body, I want you to let go of the reins. I want you to tell yourself, I let go. And see if your body needs to move anywhere in space. See if your body wants to go anywhere and listen to where it wants to go and let it go where it needs to. Does it wanna move? Does it wanna hold a stretch? Does it wanna stay still? Does it need to move at all? Unwindings are very individualized based off of the things that we are holding on to. So for this part, I'm going to put on a little bit of music just so that we can kind of feel into it. And this part, you really just want to listen to your body and let your body do what it is. 
and it might feel silly and that's totally okay. And it might feel like you wanna laugh or cry and that's totally okay. It might feel like you get some anger coming up and that is totally okay. Listen to what your body wants. Too often we don't listen to our body, we listen too much to our minds. Listen to what your body wants, and if it wants to go somewhere in space, where does it want to go? Is there a reason that it wants to go there? Don't forget to breathe. Breathing is very important. And say to yourself, I let go. Listen to the wisdom of your body. Listen to what your body wants and listen to what your body needs. So that admittedly is a little short when it comes to unwindings, but come back to yourself now. Close your eyes if, you're, if they're opened. Breathing again, deep breaths from your stomach. And I want you to see that arbor again and that stone path. and walk that stone path back from arbor to arbor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, and allow yourself to be heavy. Allow yourself to be really in your body again. Ugh. Warm yourself up a little bit if you need to. And water. <laughs> So I hope that some of these techniques um, are helpful for you when it comes to maybe starting a self-care regimen, or even if you don't have a regimen, then just ways to take care of yourself at various points in the future. Thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for being a part of this. I was very excited to present this and I hope that you all enjoyed yourselves. If anyone has any questions or anything, um, I, you know, we got time for some Q and A. Um, and uh, let me, we have a lot of chats going on right now. Oh, cool. Uh, am I correct in thinking that fascia can repair itself? Um, it can, 
it can be very much like any sort of tissue when it gets damaged. Um, when we put down scar tissue, what happens is the body goes, fix it, fix it, fix it. And it just kind of throws cells at it and it throws uh, tissue at it. And it's not, um, it's not healed in a very linear way, like the rest of our tissue, which is why scar tissue sometimes can, you know, our scars can hurt or our scars are actually weaker than our usual tissue because it's just kind of hodgepodge together. Um, so myofascial release can actually help to break down scar tissue so that tissue can actually reform in a healthier way, uh, as well as massage too. Um, Lilith, I'm having heartburn. Oh, Lilith, I'm so sorry that you were having heartburn. Are you doing okay? <laughs> has, it, has it passed or we're good? Okay, good. All right, sorry guys, I am just going through the chat. Um, fabulous. Oh, yay. I am so glad that you guys had a great experience. When you work on a client, is telescoping something you ask them to do? Oh, okay. Alyssa, when I work on someone, that is actually the telescoping is traction. You're correct. Yeah. So when, if you wind up being a client on someone's table, you won't have to telescope yourself. That is for the self technique. Um, a, a myofascial therapist will actually apply traction and be doing the pulling for you. Basically, you just have to lie there and enjoy the experience. <laughs> Alrighty. Can MFR help with sciatica? Yes, it can. It most certainly can. Um, I have a lot of sciatic patients and the sciatic nerve goes through that piriformis muscle in the butt and it can just suck. So MFR can most certainly help with sciatic issues. Um, the tightness could be coming from anywhere. So leg pulls or like telescoping of the legs could be really good. Um, one thing that you could do, which I didn't go into because um, that it requires having something. If you have something like a tennis ball, you can actually sit on the tennis ball and sit on it for about five minutes and see what release you have. So uh, a ball is a good thing to use. If anyone wants to learn some more self techniques, there is this wonderful book, Comprehensive Myofascial Self-Treatment, which will show you different ways that you can turn any stretch into a myofascial stretch. This is actually where I got some of the material for this workshop. And it will also go into foam rollers, and it will also go into small balls, like I just mentioned, and how you can hold that. So, um, and if anyone is a giant science nerd like I am, oh, author, Patty, it is Joyce uh, Carnes, Joyce Carnes. <laughs> yes, I will definitely provide the resources for everybody. I will put them in the chat. Um, if you are a science nerd like me and you want to see the fascial system from an endoscopic view. I highly, re Alyssa, I think you're gonna really like this book. Architecture of Human Living Fascia. If you are a giant nerd like I am. Um, the reason that our bodies and our medical system is so reductive is because most of what we learned is from cadavers, but you can't learn the fascia from a cadaver because the, the fascia is such a living system. You can't just like, it, it doesn't move. It, it, there's no, it's not like a muscle or an organ where you can like take it out. <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, uh, this guy was actually able to get endoscopy uh, pictures and videos of the fascia system on his living patients. He's a hand surgeon and that's amazing. And then anyone who's interested in learning more about myofascial release, I highly recommend John F. Barnes, Myofascial Release, Healing Ancient Wounds. Um, this is the man that I learned from last year for a couple different seminars. He is the man that created the approach that I uh, that I do on my clients. He is the man that I call a magician, even though he doesn't use that terminology. <laughs> so let's see, what do we have in the chat? Cool, so, anatomy trains. Oh, cool, yeah, I've heard of anatomy trains, Alyssa. I have not, um, have not attended or taken any of the classes or gotten any materials though. <coughs> so does 
anyone have any questions or anything they would like me to clarify before we sign off? Well, thank you. Um, so if people want to go ahead and uh, Corellian Tradition Facebook page has been broadcasting it. So that's a great place uh, if you want to put comments that you can see them again after this. And we'll be putting more up uh, later. So thank you. Um, and you know what? Before we go, I'm going to throw the information for these books as well as my email address um, and contact information into the chat so people can contact me if they need to. Don't mind me, I am on an iPad and I am trying to type on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and Timony, I've got a question. Yes. I'm on Facebook and mm -hmm. I typed in your name that you just typed in. Mm -hmm. But uh, I came across a Christina Murray Fox. Is that oh, you? yeah, that's the Christina Murray is actually my personal page. And the other one is like my public figure page that I kind of created for this event. <laughs> so you can send me a friend request if you want to. Um, I'm usually not in the camp of accepting friend requests from people that I haven't met personally, which is why I created the other page. But what else? <laughs> because I cannot find you under the under the name that you gave me this uh, so uh... <laughs> okay yeah that's fine um feel free to shoot me a friend request in that case just uh, did okay turning off my voice again there we go okay all of the books and everything are in the chat um my contact information is in there um yeah anything else that you guys need before we before we sign off no okay well thank you everyone for joining it was so nice to see all some, some familiar faces and some new faces and i'm really hoping that you all got some uh, some good information out of this <laughs>